Hello, and welcome to the recent stream. I'm Zach Weissmuller, joined by my co-host, Liz Wolf. And today we're going to react to some clips from the second GOP presidential debate, which took place last night at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library and Museum in California. A fact that we were reminded of regularly with constant invocations of Reagan's name and legacy. And here to help us make sense of what to make of the state of the GOP going into the 2024 election is Josh Barrow, a journalist and commentator who currently co-hosts the Serious Trouble podcast with Ken White and writes the very serious newsletter published on Substack. Josh, thank you for joining us. Hi, Zach. Thanks for having me. Hi, Liz. Before we, hey, uh, yeah, before we get into the clips uh, that all of us have chosen, I want to ask both of you, you know, all of us here, none of us here are loyal, committed GOP voters. Uh, we're also, I, I don't think any of us are loyal, committed uh, Democrat voters. So independence, looking at this, at this latest debate, what did the overall tone and substance make you feel about the current state of the GOP? And let's start with Josh. Uh, well, so first of all, I, I am a Democrat, often somewhat reluctantly. I also used to be a Republican quite reluctantly. I think that political parties are important vehicles for influence in the country, and it makes sense to be a member of one, even if they drive you crazy all the time. Uh, but you know, th the thing that I found remarkable about this debate is how just completely detached from reality it was. Like the Obviously, mm -hmm. the front runner's not there. Um, and to the extent that the people on this stage are running for president, and that extent varies from like low to no, they are running against Donald Trump. And yet the debate was structured like it, that they were running against each other. And it's like an argument over whether Nikki Haley or Tim Scott is the better choice to be the Republican presidential nominee. And that's just that's not a question anybody's asking. That's not the question before anybody. And so a lot of it just felt very theoretical in, in a way that some of the 2020 Democratic debates felt, where it was like, you know, arguing over exactly which flavor of single payer we're going to implement if we win this election and have a majority of four in the House of Representatives. Um, but but even more theoretical than that, because at least, you know, the, it was you could close your eyes and imagine the idea that you'd have some election that resulted in Elizabeth Warren being elected president or something like that. Whereas here, you know, like I, I spend no time thinking about the possibility that Tim Scott is going to be president of the United States. 18 months from now. So mm. it just, it kind of felt like a useless exercise in certain ways. Mm. Would it feel more useful if there was a narrower group of candidates on the stage at this point? Uh, maybe, but it, the main thing is they need to talk about Donald Trump more. And I don't mean that they need to talk mm. about Donald Trump more in the sense of like, they just need to talk about how awful he is. And especially, I don't mean they need to talk about how, how awful he is in the, in the same way that you would if you were a Democrat running in a general election. But they need to be making the case like, why should you nominate me instead of Trump? Because that is the only relevant question before Republican voters right now. If, they, if they're going to vote for one of these people, it has to, they have to have decided that they're not going to vote for Trump. And you have to make that case. And, and you, there were glimpses of this. And you see, there, there are ways to do this without running at him from the left. And you saw Ron DeSantis making pieces of this argument and saying, you know, we need a two term president picking specific pieces of his record on debt and that sort of thing and criticizing them for basically not being conservative enough. Uh, but it. it Really, that's like that's the only important argument for these candidates to be making is, you know, why why me instead of him? And it just felt like only a very small fraction of the debate was actually focused on that. Hmm. What was your reaction, Liz? I am sort of stunned by how they don't know how to take the W. I keep thinking about this uh, in relation to the DeSantis candidacy uh, and the DeSantis campaign. And it's like, well, wait a second. You have in my view, a pretty excellent, unimpeachably good record to, to lean on with COVID policy in the state of Florida, with executive experience. Uh, I believe he won the first uh, the first time to be the governor uh, by a pretty slim margin, but the second time much more handily. Uh, a lot of the people who live there, perhaps you included, Zach, uh, are very happy with his record. So I'm kind of stunned by how a lot of these Republicans don't know how to convert that legitimate leadership experience, some really good executive experience 
into something that actually appeals to voters. I mean, even when questions on inflation are dangled before the slate of candidates, they don't seem to know how to actually connect with people. I'm sorry, but this should be a relatively easy pitch. The Donald Trump question, which I think you're totally right about, Josh, that's a lot harder to figure out how they got to position themselves in relation to him. And I think we've seen a lot of missteps so far. But with a whole bunch of like issues that affect the lives and pocketbooks of everyday Americans, this should be a pretty easy thing. I mean, I think the Youngkin playbook is actually kind of an interesting to, thing to look for. Um, you know, basically, when you have your opponent, uh, this was in Virginia, the gubernatorial race, when you have your opponent saying things along the lines of like, oh, well, parents shouldn't really have control over what kids are taught in the classrooms, a bunch of parents respond really negatively to that, regardless of partisanship. And I'm kind of surprised that COVID record inflation, uh, issues related to just absolutely horrible performance of public schools and the influence of teachers unions, which I think a lot of leftists have sort of become a little bit more aware of and a little more pissed off by lately. Uh, all of these things could be winning issues. And for whatever reason, a lot of these candidates don't seem to know how to convert their beliefs or their positions or their experience into something that's actually a really compelling pitch to voters. Yeah, I mean, uh, speaking as someone coming to you from DeSantis land, yes, I I generally am pretty happy with how things are done here in Florida, the, the governance. Um, I've got some bones to pick on various approaches to trying to shape the school curriculums and so forth. But on kind of the big picture things, it's unfortunate, though, that, as you say, it's presented in this kind of wrapper. And, and I have to be mindful of the fact that I am not the audience for this uh, Republican primary. So it's it's going to be in that culture war wrapper. It's going to be buried beneath, you know, calls uh, to put troops on the Mexican border, which we'll get to soon. Um, and then, you know, to, to Josh's point, you know, I, I think that it, it has been a, a real problem that uh, the 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 orange elephant in the room is just never seems to be addressed uh, head on, and and maybe uh, if the field gets winnowed down, that that'll change. But let's uh, pivot into some of the clips that we've pulled to react to. Um, the the first one uh, that that Josh said he wanted to talk about was. Uh, DeSantis seemingly calling for military intervention in Mexico. Let's roll that and talk about it. As commander in chief, I'm going to use the U.S. military to go after the Mexican drug cartels. They are killing our people. And the stories that I've seen in Florida, we had an infant, 18 months, parents rented an Airbnb. And apparently the people that had rented it before were using drugs. The infant was crawling, the toddler was crawling on the carpet and ingested a fentanyl residue yep. and died. Are we just gonna sit here and let this happen, this carnage happen in our country? I am not going to do that. So I guarantee you on day one, this border is gonna be a day one issue for me as president. We're gonna declare it a national emergency. Yes, we'll build the wall, we'll do remain in Mexico, but those Mexican drug cartels are gonna be treated like the foreign right, terrorist go organizations that they are. So is that a threat to invade Mexico? Yeah, like, is it a declaration of war on day one, right? Like, what's the legal mechanism here? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think war you, know, terror. You, can, you can imagine a situation, and, and, and Mike Pence has had sort of more reality-based things to say about this. You could imagine a situation where you have some sort of cooperation with the Mexican government that involves deploying U.S. military assets in Mexico with their permission, and maybe you could even pressure them in certain ways into doing that. But I, I, don't, I don't think it's at all clear that you necessarily would succeed at that. AMLO is, you know, is very much a nationalist and I think is unlikely to be keen on the idea of the U.S. military attacking cartels in, inside Mexico. And if you do that without the Mexican government's permission, you, you have invaded Mexico. It's like it's it's this really it's this really hawkish, bizarre idea that could have all sorts of negative unintended effects. And it's just sort of being thrown out there like it's a thing like, oh, just like send the military. Um, and also, like, you can't you can't you'd have to send troops if you wanted to do this sort of thing. I mean, you can't because I mean, part of the problem with the fentanyl trade is because fentanyl is physically so small, the quantity of it that you need. And because it's synthesized uh, uh, artificially, you can't just like identify sites from the sky and drop chemicals on them or bomb them or that sort of thing. 
It, it, mm. If you were truly to have an effective operation like this, you would have to have a U.S. military presence in Mexico, which would be a huge policy change. And if they're really threatening to do that without the without Mexico's permission, that's literally a threat to invade, which just seems crazy. Yeah, and the more moderate uh, Nikki Haley position is just spend send special operations there. So it would be a sort of, I guess, like off the books uh, CIA operation or something like that. Um, I mean, the, the underlying issues here are that uh, we've got we've got our immigration problems and then the drug war. And from my perspective, the uh, the inflow of fentanyl into the country has been a direct result of uh, drug prohibition. Uh, fentanyl has exist existed as a uh, a, med a medication and anest an anesthetic uh, in hospitals, but the reason that it's spilled onto the streets is because we went from an opioid epidemic to a heroin problem to now a fentanyl problem, and I think that the approach that you know that 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 dis the discussion around decriminalization harm reduction is of course completely off the table for the GOP, but there, there's also the question of immigration, which is, uh, you know, brought up uh, uh, over and over again um, uh, on, on that stage. And for the amount of times that uh, Ronald Reagan was invoked, there was not a discussion of the fact that the Reagan Republicans were a much more welcoming party. I mean, Reagan at the time, you know, uh, offered an amnesty and also basically was talking about a you know, a, a, a highway connecting Canada, Mexico and uh, and the U.S. Like we're all you know, we're going to have a new North American alliance. Um, so that's is obviously in far in the rear view now. But it's it, it's got to be part of the solution. Uh, any serious solution to, to any of these problems is uh, actually allow uh, figuring out a way to meet the demand of the people who want to come and live and work here peacefully. Liz, Completely. what do you think? I, I think uh, there's also an interesting component of this, which is very difficult to argue against because I think it effectively tugs at people's heartstrings. But like the anecdote that DeSantis cites about the 18 month old baby who was crawling on the floor of an Airbnb and touched fentanyl and ingested fentanyl in some way and died as a result of this. I mean, I don't know if you guys saw the daycare, the Bronx daycare, what, mm -hmm. which was, um, this was a story, I think basically last week where a two year old in New York city died of, uh, I guess, ingesting fentanyl in the daycare, despite having passed all of its city inspections, was actually being used as a drug front. And so now the city is going after the people who were running the daycare and, and running the drug front as well. Um, but it's it's interesting, right? Because these stories capture people's imaginations. It's kind of a little bit of a throwback to milk carton kids. And we see this moral panic surrounding kids, kids and razor blades, kids and fentanyl, kids and, you know, whatever they might be able to access. And A, I, I, I need to like sort of independently do my own research and actually verify that this anecdote exists because just because somebody said it on a debate stage does not mean it is actually grounded in fact. And two, like, I think it's actually probably better to bring the discussion closer to reality where like, yes, maybe every once in a while there's an anomalous, absurd, absurdly terrifying story uh, like the Bronx daycare one or like this 18 month old in this Airbnb. But fundamentally, we don't really have a country where like millions of children are ingesting fentanyl and dying each year. Like, let's well, be very clear about what the problem is. There is an opioid crisis, but I think it would actually be better to focus the conversation on the median opioid user and addict um, and how to get them the treatment that they need, not these outlier cases. Well, but I mean, the, the problem, I mean, these these cases are not the typical fentanyl problem, but we're, you know, we're having on the order of 100,000 drug overdose yeah, deaths a, exactly. a year in the country. It's And it's massively higher than it used to be. And it's, you know, it's it's a legitimately extremely hard policy problem. I think a much harder policy yeah. problem than, than the immigration issue, which I think we know what the trade-offs are and what the solutions would be. The, I mean, the reason we ended up with this fentanyl problem, as, as you described, Zach, is we went through this period where the 
uh, prescribing uh, guidelines for opioids were, were much too lax. And this seems to have been largely an honest mistake. There was a sense in medicine that basically, you know, lots of people have chronic pain and this was a safe way to treat chronic pain. And it was a huge mistake and it created this large number of people with opioid addictions. And then you had that progression in the market through heroin and then fentanyl. But I think, you know, one lesson to take from that is that if you had an even if you had an even more permissive legal opioid policy, where it was not just that we were going to go back to writing a lot more prescriptions, but that we were going to, you know, get rid of prohibition, and allow people to just go out and buy Percocet if they wanted, you would still have a tremendous number of, of addicts and overdose deaths. And you, you wouldn't have two-year-olds stumbling upon a block of fentanyl in the, back of a, in the back of a daycare because it would be a legal market. But the legal market would be a source of enormous problems in the country. And so it's, you know, the, the, it, it's not like marijuana where you can just, you know, look at the, the costs and the benefits and say, you know, prohibition was ridiculous and we're better off with, with permitting this. You know, you're, you end up with enormous social costs regardless of which policy you choose. And I think that's part of why you end up getting this fantastical, like, let's invade Mexico. Because if there was a, a simpler, clearer thing to do about it, that's what they'd be proposing to do. Which is not to say that yeah. I think the Mexico thing is going to work. It's just people people get into these realms when they lack a, a good answer. Yeah, I, I, think... I, I agree that there's no, uh, there's no perfect solution. Um, and th th that opioids are certainly a, a much more damaging drug when abused than something like cannabis. Um, the problem is that shift it, you know, cracking down on the opioids after that, the over prescription happened, then made basically what it led to is a lot of people turning to heroin. Yeah. And then once that demand for heroin went up, then, oh, look, it's cheap. It's even more efficient to just make this in a lab in China or wherever, and then sneak it over the border. And so I think that, you know, that there could be a more sophisticated conversation about trade-offs and accepting that these that there are going to be social ills, but perhaps there are less damaging uh, interventions than uh, kind of the simplistic, let's just crack down on it and see, you know, what pops up next. Uh, Liz, I interrupted you. Regard there, regardless, the type of conversation that you guys are modeling, which acknowledges some externalities and unintended consequences that arise from different policies and trace the evolution of how we got into this mess. To me, that's a much more interesting way to do debate. And so I really, really wish, and I know this will never really happen in US politics, but I wish we could move away from like 18 month old baby stumbled across a little bit of fentanyl and died. And it's like the super outlier, moral panicky type case and toward the types of things that you guys are talking about, which I think are both extremely valid ways of approaching this. I'm sorry, but like if we actually want serious policymaking and serious people in the White House, we should have the expectation that that's where the conversation happens, as opposed to whatever bullshit we saw on the stage last night. Liz, you wanted to talk about the education segment where DeSantis and Nikki Haley talk about school choice and other ed reforms uh, in South Carolina, in their respective states of South Carolina and Florida. Let's roll that clip. You say school choice is the answer, but South Carolina, your home state, still has not enacted universal school choice, and even the current expansion won't be fully implemented until 2027. Parents can't wait four years for a fix, so what would you do right now? Well, and school choice isn't the only answer, but I'll tell you it's not out of a lack of trying that we didn't try and get school choice in South Carolina. What I'll tell you, first of all, is we have to acknowledge the fact that 67 percent of our eighth graders are not proficient in reading or math. Over 80 percent of our eighth graders aren't proficient in history or civics. And recently they came out and said our 12 and 13 year olds are scoring at the lowest levels they've been scoring in reading and math in decades. So the first thing we've got to do is we've got to make sure we catch our kids back up. We have to make sure they can read. A child that can't read by third grade is four times less likely to graduate high school. We need to do reading remediation. We need complete transparency in the classroom. No parent should ever wonder what's being said or taught to their child in the classroom. We need to make sure that we have school choice so that there's competition. We need to move all the programs from the federal government down to the states and let states decide what education looks like in their states. Right. And we need to start building things in America again. Let's put vocational right. classes back in our high schools and let's get our kids building the things that we know that we can make. When we start to focus on that and really bring in that parental 
involvement, that's when we'll start to see a difference. But we've got to get parents back included. We've got to quit spending time on this DEI and CRT and instead focus on financial literacy, on digital liter literacy, and on making sure that our kids know what they need to do to have the jobs of the next generation. Oh, here's the deal. Our country's education system is in decline because it's focused on indoctrination, denying parents' rights. Florida represents the revival of American education. We're ranked number one in the nation in education by U.S. News and World Report. My wife and I, we have a six, five, and three-year-old. This is personal to us. We didn't just talk about universal school choice. We enacted universal school choice. We didn't just talk about parents' bill of rights. We enacted the parents' bill of rights. We eliminated critical race theory, and we now have American civics in the Constitution, in our schools, in a really big way, just like President Reagan asked for in his farewell address back in 1989. Florida is showing how it's done. We're standing with parents, and our kids are benefiting. What struck you about that, Liz? So I think DeSantis is much more rhetorically compelling there. Uh, Haley sort of laundry listed uh, to a degree that I found quite obnoxious and annoying. But the substance of what she's saying is, I think, so important. This is really, I mean, the time is absolutely ripe for a move towards school choice. There are more people now than ever opting out of the public school system. We are seeing this sort of revolution in terms of a return to phonics-based education. For a long time, the literacy programs used in most public schools in the country for maybe the last 10 years, 15 years, have not actually been preparing people to read at grade level. And so we're seeing these huge issues. All the statistics that Nikki Haley cited um, are accurate. It's a huge problem. And for Nikki Haley to ground the issues with public schools in those clear stats versus culture war stuff, at least to me, I would much prefer to have somebody like that in charge. I think that's so important. It's actually very focused on things that affect real families. We can argue all day about whether or not Maya Kobabe's gender queer is in school libraries or not, but fundamentally, whether or not children are literate, to me, that's one of the most fundamental jobs uh, of public schools. And I appreciate Nikki Haley bringing the conversation there. It does bother me, though, that in this moment when, from the Republican perspective, Teachers unions exercised so much influence over the course of the pandemic and kept schools shut for so long. They elbowed their way to the front of the vaccination lines, claiming that that would allow schools to be opened in person sooner and then kind of went back on their words. We had the hysterics and the melodramatics of them, you know, doing all those protests, I think, in Chicago and L.A., where they brought coffins to marches saying, basically, if you put us back in the classroom, if you reopen public schools, we, the teachers, will die um, en masse as a result of this. We saw hor horrifying behavior from teachers unions over the course of the pandemic. So you would think that this election would be where people like Ron DeSantis and people like Nikki Haley can really make a forceful pitch and say, look, like the school library stuff is crazy, like leftists are being a little bananas there, but really more than anything, Literacy is an issue. Teachers unions behaved abysmally. COVID was a disgrace. The degree to which schools were kept shut for so long. You would think they would be able to convert all of that into a really salient, compelling pitch for school choice. And I'm kind of frustrated by the fact that like DeSantis's substance isn't there, but Nikki Haley's form isn't there. I, I find something odd about this conversation in, in that, you know, they're talking about returning power to the states and then further devolving the power from the states by having universal school choice. But then they're also offering all of this prescriptive guidance about how education should work. And, you know, obviously a president mm -hmm. can have influence. And if you have a regime like that, the, there are things that the president can do that that might influence the way that schools educate and what's in curricula and how phonics is taught and that sort of thing. But ultimately, if you if you believe this stuff about having this much more decentralized education system with power, the federal government pay, plays a smaller role. State and local governments effectively play a smaller role because you're going to have school choice and vouchers and parents deciding where they're going to send their money, then you kind of don't get to make the decisions about, you know, is there going to be CRT in the curriculum? Um, you know, why, how are they going to teach reading? All those sorts of things. And sort of the, I, th I think there's a tension there. It's like, do we do we have a bunch of top-down ideas about how education needs to work differently? Or are we deciding that we're not going to impose those sorts of ideas and we'll just let parents do whatever they want? 
Yep, I agree that the tension is there. And you even hear it in DeSantis's answer where he's talking about universal school choice being implemented in Florida, which I think is a great thing, which I'm benefiting from. But at the same time, he's talking about, uh, you know, uh, implementing a certain civics curriculum that Ronald Reagan would have loved. And that, that is the tension that is unfortunately at the center of a lot of this ed policy at the moment. I mean, Glenn Youngkin in Virginia basically ran uh, successfully against all of the, you know, the, the excesses or like the drag queen story hour stuff. And that uh, is fine if you're, and I mean, the thing is, it actually, it, it worked. It activated a lot of parents who were worried about what their kids are getting exposed to in school. But then you've got who I people who I see as bad actors, uh, the Chris Rufos of the world, who they are not really interested in kind of the pluralistic vision of school choice that I favor. They're interested in just a takeover and sort of, you know, transmitting their values through a state run system. Uh, so I think that's something we have to be, uh, you know, th those of us who on this stream and who are listening, who are advocates of that need to be a little bit on guard against in, in this whole conversation. I mean, the through line with so much of this is the policies they are actually advocating for cannot really be put into effect the way that they seem to claim. I'm sorry, but like we're talking about like declaring war with Mexico. We're talking about doing all of this crazy top down engineering of the public school system, despite the fact that so much of that is state based. It's totally untethered from reality. I, I just quickly note, I, I'm I, I'm skeptical of the narrative that Glenn Youngkin won on education. Certainly he ran on education and he won, mm -hmm. but they had an, a governor's election in New Jersey on the same day where the Republican candidate overperformed by even more. New Jersey's a blue state, so the Republican narrowly lost. And then the swing toward Youngkin was, was pretty uniform across urban, suburban, rural areas in Virginia. So it's not like it was a specific thing in these, you know, Loudoun County, Fairfax County, this handful of suburban districts mm -hmm. where there were these curriculum disputes. I think that, you know, it was a rough environment for Democrats in 2021 politically for a number of reasons. And I think Youngkin won there. I don't I don't I don't really think that it was specifically about the education issue. Well, so what do you make of that gaffe then? I mean, we saw big polling upticks right after that. I guess that gaffe happened very close to the election. But like, what are other explanations that you posit? I, I think, you know, I, I think there was a lot of dissatisfaction with the fact that the the reopening from COVID had not gone as it was supposed to. Uh, and we were, you know, starting to have an inflation problems and we were having shortages. I think it's, you know, I think it's a lot of the same issues. Look, I don't I, I don't think it was great that Terry McAuliffe went on that debate stage and said that he didn't what I forget what the exact quote was, but, you know, that education shouldn't be up to parents or whatever it was. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I just, you know, I, I feel like if it was if it was really about these these school board fights, I would have thought you would have seen a greater swing in the parts of the state where the school board fights were really salient, which was basically the suburbs. But OK, I so that, I, I, I think that, that that's well taken and that's an interesting theory. But the thing that I'm curious about is like just because it was playing out in Loudoun County or what have you doesn't mean that coal country Virginians weren't also looking at that and being like, yeah, hell yeah, like go, go, go get him. I guess. I mean, I don't like I, I guess it depends how rational voters are. I mean, I, most of those voters are in a county where there's a school board that's not going to go in for any of this faddish stuff anyway. But so it's not like they need the governor to stop their it. school board from doing something. I mean, it's probably like yeah. my counter to that would just be like just because it's unlikely to happen to them doesn't mean Appalachian voters aren't riled up by that. That's, uh, that, that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I like your pushback on that hypothesis, though. That may, frankly it makes me want to dig in a little bit deeper to the polling data and sort of like. Mm -hmm do a little bit of a retrospective there. So the first clip that I wanted to talk about here was this scuffle over Ukraine, where you've got DeSantis and Ramaswamy on one side. Uh, and also, by the way, more or less, uh, they're on, they're taking the Trump position on this issue. Uh, and then everyone else on another. Let's play that. Today, the Republican Party is at odds over aid to Ukraine. The price tag so far is $76 billion. But is it in our best interest to degrade Russia's military for less than 5% of what we pay annually on defense, especially when there are no U.S. soldiers in the fight? 
It's in our interest to end this war, and that's what I will do as president. We are not going to have a blank check. We will not have U.S. troops, and we're going to make the Europeans do what they need to do. But they've sent money to pay uh, bureaucrats' pensions and salaries and funding small businesses halfway around the world. Meanwhile, our own country is being invaded. Uh, we don't even have control of our own territory. We have got to defend the American people before we even worry about all these other things. I will say, let's, t let's, let's debate the fact that our national vital interest is in degrading the Russian military. By degrading the Russian military, we actually keep our homeland safer, we keep our troops at home, and we all understand Article 5 of NATO. We have when to level fact, with the American people. I, I thought you said something just, about waiting until your turn to I, talk. I so well, hold on there. So at the end point, of the day, I'm going to finish my, I'll be happy to debate you on this. I'll, I'll respond. I'll look forward to this one right now. Um, so at the end of the day, when you think about the fact that if you want to keep American troops at home, the attack on NATO territory would bring us and our troops in. We have to level with the American people on this issue. The reality is we just because, just because Putin people. is not an e Putin's an evil dictator does not mean that Ukraine is good. This is a country that has banned 11 opposition parties. A win that has for actually, Russia is a that win is not for true. China. We're driving Russia. Russia excuse me, ex China. excuse me, if you have but a chance. I forgot, you like you'll China, have, that's no, why you, you're you'll have, you'll have your chance in just a moment. Yeah. You'll, the hurling personal insults isn't helping. China is the real enemy and we're driving Russia further into China's arms. We need a reasonable peace plan to end this, especially if this is a country whose president just last week Vivek, was if hailing you let a Nazi Putin in his have ranks. Ukraine, that's a and green light to China is, to take Taiwan. We need okay, so the, what I appreciate about this is that this is the only the, it it represents, I think possibly the one of the most important kind of political realignments in the past 10 years. And the fact that this is the only place that that debate is really happening, I think, is interesting and noteworthy. I mean, uh, I think most of the uh, Democrats seem, uh, you know, on the same page on this. The There's a majority of the Republicans on this that stage also are. But then you've got this Vivek, DeSantis, Trump group that is skeptical of kind of a, what what they characterize as a, a blank check for Ukraine. And, you know, we're all sympathetic to the Ukrainians, but we do have to take account of the fact that the U.S. is the biggest uh, funder of Ukraine, both in terms well. Combining uh, combined military and financial funding, we you know dwarf the next in line, which would be the EU, and as such, we play a huge role in how this all unfolds. Like we could be the the moderator set up there, kind of implied that you know it's just a fraction of the U.S.'s military budget, which is true. But I think the bigger point is that because we are providing so much, we have a big say in how much pressure is put on people to come to the negotiating table or, you know, how long this continues on. We've got, you know, estimates of half a million uh, uh, military casualties on both sides, uh, combined on both sides, uh, 24,000 civilian casualties. So there's a high p price being paid here, obviously. Um, and I think that it's an important conversation. I, I think that it shouldn't just go unexamined. Uh, the second thing I just want to say about it is that what I don't like is how then there's always a pivot to the new enemy, which is like, okay, we can't keep writing a blank check to Ukraine because we need to send troops to Mexico or we need to amp up our pressure on China. I, I think that's still... That that's that's an ongoing problem uh, with the GOP and that that and our our politics in general that there always has to be a real clearly defined enemy um, to look tough going up against. I think there's an interesting contrast here between DeSantis and Ramaswamy because I think Ron DeSantis has been intentionally actually pretty vague on this. And, you know, the the tone in which he talks about this is a tone that appeals to people who think that the U.S. has been too involved in this. But really, you know, when he says, you know, no blank check, 
nobody is in favor of a blank check. Um, that can mean anything. That doesn't that doesn't mean that you're not going to send any more support. It's an indication of some sort of skepticism. But you know, the, there are pe there are Republicans who have been criticizing Joe Biden for not doing enough and not sending enough munitions. And there have been weapon systems that Ukraine has sought that certain people in Congress would like him to send that Biden has has blocked sending. So you know, it's the Joe Biden is already in a position of doing some but not all of the things that the Ukraine hawks would like done. And I think that Ron DeSantis is leaving that option open. Um, whereas Ramaswamy has this sort of cockamamie idea that you can come in and impose a settlement um, mm -hmm. and that one of the terms of that settlement is that you require Russia to break its alliance with China, which is both, I think, something that Russia would be unlikely to overtly agree to. And even if they did, you wouldn't have a good mechanism for enforcing that. You can't just like turn all of geopolitics on one meeting like that. It's this very it's this very amateurish idea that he has of, of how foreign policy works. And I think it, you know, it, it glosses over the fact that, that this debate happens as though it's like the U.S. government decides what the nature of this war is going to be. But it's not just mm. that Ukraine is a sovereign country um, that already is not doing certain things we'd like them to do. But there's also Europe is here. And, you know, I think I think almost everyone agrees with Ron DeSantis that we would like the European countries to be stepping up their commitments. And to some extent, they've already been doing that. They've been increasing their defense budgets. And I think that's been a healthy shift toward Europe taking on more of the responsibility for its own defense. But I think, you know, the idea that you're going to give you part of Ukraine to Russia and get a pinky swear from Putin that he's not going to do any more invasions and that he'll he'd break his alliance with the Chinese. Not only will you not get that from Russia, that won't be acceptable either to Ukraine or to Europe. And therefore, it won't happen. The Russians can't make that deal if the if the EU countries are still backing Ukraine in the in this fight, which which they would be. Um, so mm -hmm. I think that you know what he's proposing is very unrealistic. And I also you know I sort of suspect that whoever the president is, policy toward Ukraine is going to change less than people are expecting that it might because you know because we are not the sole author here. The corollary to what you're saying, of course, is the fact that Vivek's uh, Taiwan plan is also not so brilliant. Um, I forget the specifics in part because they're so um, mind-bendingly stupid. Uh, but it, It's that we'll tell China they're not allowed to invade Taiwan until 2028, yeah. by which time we'll yeah. be able to make our own uh, semiconductors. Yeah, it's related to like semiconductor independence. Right. And it's like <laughs> basically, you know, going from the strategic ambiguity uh, approach now to like, and I also love that he's like publicizing this entire strategy via Twitter. And so it's not like China, like he's like, oh, we'll pull the wool <laughs> over their eyes by advertising, like by broadcasting this uh, all over yeah. Twitter. Like what? It's just this completely, it's almost like he like thinks he's like playing a board game. Like he thinks he's playing risk with people in his college <laughs> dorm or something utterly brain dead like that. And it's just, it, it's, I think it's so clear that he's not interested in having a very serious grounded in reality conversation about this, which is especially like obnoxious given the fact that so much of Congress right now is occupied by this question of what to do about Ukraine aid. Uh, and there's these interesting sort of far right-ish dissenters in the House that are actually really making a huge stink about this. So you would think that this would be a good jumping off point for some of these people on stage to be able to more cogently, reasonably discuss um, whether or not that's a good strategy, what they would do as the executive. And instead, Vivek is just like, oh yeah, we'll just like disallow China from doing certain things until 2028. It's like, <laughs> what planet are you living in? Well, it's one where he's well, never going to be president, so he won't have to make good on it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, well, we're on Vivek. Let's go to the next clip, which is about Vivek Ramaswamy joining TikTok <laughs> after the influencer turned MMA fighter Jake Paul apparently talked him into it. Let's call that. TikTok is banned on government-issued devices because of its ties to the Chinese government. Yet you joined TikTok at the dinner with boxer and influencer Jake Paul. Should the commander-in-chief be so easily persuaded by an influencer? So the answer is I have a radical idea for the Republican Party. We need to win elections. And part of how we win elections is reaching the next generation of young Americans where they are. So when I get into office, I've been very clear. Kids under the age of social, under the age of 16, should not be using addictive social media. We're only going to ever get to declaring independence from China, which I favor, if we actually win. So while the Democrats are running rampant, reaching the next generation three to one, there's exactly one person in the Republican Party which talks a big game about reaching young people, 
and that's me. This is infuriating <laughs> because TikTok is one of the most dangerous social right. media apps yes, that is. we could have. And what you've got, I honestly, every time I hear you, I feel a little bit dumber for what you say <laughs> because I can't believe <laughs> they hear that you've got a TikTok situation. What they're doing is these 150 million people are on TikTok. <laughs> that means they can get your contacts, they can get your financial information, they can get your emails, they can Let get me just text say, messages, they can get all I, this of is these important. things. This is China very important knows for our exactly party. What they're this doing. is very important what for our party, and I'm going to say You've it. gone and you've we helped China stop. build, make medicines in China, excuse not America. Me, excuse you're me. now wanting kids to go and get on the social media that's dangerous for all of no. us. You went and you were in business with the Chinese that gave Hunter Biden $5 million. We can't trust you. We so can't me, trust you. We can't have something. TikTok yeah. in our I think kids' lives. We, this we is need to ban it. Mr. Ramaswamy, you have 15 seconds. I think, excuse me. You have 15 seconds, Mr. Ramaswamy. Thank you. I think we would be better served as a Republican Party if we're not sitting here hurling personal insults and actually have a legitimate debate I, I, about policy. I, you know, obviously there, there's several dimensions to this policy debate, and some of them are stupider than others. I, I just find it remarkable that, you know, this has been identified as a problem by both political parties for several years at this point, And there's been a lot of fighting over it. And this nonsense that they tried to do in the Trump administration, where they're going to, like, get a big deal for Oracle to do the server pr provision mm -hmm. for TikTok, which didn't seem to address any of the problems, but would make a whole bunch of money for Oracle. But basically, you know, the... The criticism here that I think is the most valid is that, you know, free speech and free markets do not require you to allow an author authoritarian foreign government to own and control a media entity in the United States. And in fact, we've already forced the Chinese to disgorge one social platform, which was Grindr, uh, which was acquired by a Chinese controlled company a few years ago. And that was re reviewed by the the CFIUS committee in the in Treasury Department and found that that was a national security risk. And they were forced to sell the app back to a U.S. owner. Um, and that, you know, that that didn't interfere with people's ability to access Grindr, um, but it did ensure that, you know, the, that we were protecting this, you know, th this platform that contained a lot of information from Americans from being controlled by a by a hostile foreign entity. And I think, you know, I think it is a real concern that, you know, the TikTok algorithm, which is a black box, gives the Chinese government, which is unelected, a lot of ability to to influence the way in which information is received by Americans. I don't think we would have allowed the Soviets to do that during the Cold War. And so it seems it feels to me like there's a there's a relatively narrow policy area here where, the, you know, there's there's some talk of whether you could use the existing law that was used for Grindr, whether you could use that on TikTok because of some U.S. based entities that they've already acquired, saying that, you know, TikTok is a formerly U.S. company that was acquired. But even if it wasn't, you could have a new law and you could have a solution where you don't take TikTok away from anyone, but you make sure that it is not controlled by the Chinese government, which it seems to me like that mm -hmm. there shouldn't even be a libertarian objection to because we're not here to protect the 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 association rights of the Chi of the communist Chinese government. One thing yeah, I'm curious I mean, about, if you I, don't mind, well, Josh, yeah. is like what in, in your view and in the stuff that you have read, what do you think the harm caused by TikTok and TikTok's access to Americans' data is? Like, do you mind just like going into a little bit of detail there? Because I so frequently get frustrated by this conversation, this debate, because it's like, this is bad, but people infrequently expand on what specifically is bad about it. So my main concern is about the algorithm and, and the and the content that people are viewing more than it is about the user okay. data. I, you know, I think that, you know, we, first of all, we don't know the extent to which that they are making algorithmic choices that are promoting messages that are favorable to the Chinese government or suppressing messages that they don't like. But the other thing is that, you know, if you when they control this platform that like half of Americans are using, they can they can do that and flip a switch in the future. And it, it takes years to do to wrest control of it away from them. So I think it's, you know, it's worth doing even if we haven't identified something that they are doing yet, because especially if, you know, if we got into a situation, if there was a war over Taiwan, for example, where the tensions were even higher between the US and China, I don't think we'd want them having that sort of power. As yeah. for user data, I'm not that concerned about them having, you know, large volumes of data on lots of ordinary people, which is probably of very little value to the Chinese. And there are supposed to be certain privacy protections that are done, that are created by the Apple and the Google app stores. I don't have a good technological sense of how foolproof that stuff is. Um, but, you know, you, you certainly you could have specific targets of Chinese surveillance where it might be useful to have access into some relatively small number of people's phones. And I think that could be a concern. But my, my main concern is about TikTok as a media company rather than TikTok as a company that has user data.
TikTok is like yeah, a propaganda me... machine that can just easily yeah. be, right. you know, dispensing, you know, bad information to people in the event of like a Taiwan invasion. Okay, that makes sense. Right. Yeah, let me say this. It's a it's a legitimate concern for sure. Um, it is important to be real precise and like dig down into the details of what it is the government would be banning. I mean, the company that, you know, there's a parent company that owns TikTok that is based mm -hmm. in China and also runs a Chinese version of TikTok, which is much different. Mm -hmm. There's a separate company based in the U.S. that supposedly runs the U.S. version, and they mm -hmm. say there's a firewall. It's unclear how strong that firewall is. I would want any sort of ban on you know, manipulation of the public through this kind of propaganda you're talking about to be pretty well proven out uh, and something that we, the public, would be able to see instead of what we tend to get, which was the law that was proposed to ban TikTok in the first place. We, I, I encourage uh, people to go watch the, the stream we did on this, which was a sprawling law that would like, you know, was throwing in trying to regulate crypto and Bitcoin and like all uh, mm -hmm. telecommunications infrastructure. So that's kind of these things just kind of get all jammed together into this big power grab. And that's what I as a libertarian get really nervous about uh, anytime we start regulating uh, social media, even if it's, you know, potentially a hostile social media. So yeah, yeah. if you can prove that there's some sort of, um, you know, propagandizing, uh, intentional propagandizing happening from a hostile foreign government, that's one thing. But to Liz's point, it, it it can't be it can't be vague and has to be extremely targeted. Yeah, I wouldn't want the government regulating the algorithm. I mean, first, I don't really trust the government to do that. And then also, like, even if right. the government did impose a regulation, I don't know how we would ensure that that TikTok under Chinese control was following the regulation. Um, what, what I want is is ultimate Amer American control and ownership over the company. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, the I the our Constitution and our culture of free speech requires that, you know, that people be able to do things like, you know, decide what kind of information they want to disseminate on their media platform. I don't really, I don't want the, to take that out of the private sphere. I actually want to move it into the private sphere so that it's not the Chinese government, so that it's some private American entity doing that. I think it's also worth lingering on the idea that the federal government is going to regulate whether teenagers have access to social media. Um, that mm -hmm. seems like one of the crazier ideas that is just routinely floated out there on that stage. I mean, I think, you know, Vivek, uh, he has it in for the uh, young people <laughs> in general uh, between that and his uh, proposal to, you know, make everyone serve in some sort of civil service in, in order to be able to vote until their age, uh, you know, a, a higher, yeah. I think age 21 <laughs> or 25. It was 25. Uh, you know, Isn't that yeah. 25. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, he, he's going on uh, TikTok uh, with uh, Jake Paul, but I, I don't think he's courting the, the youth vote. In fact, no. he wants to, to outlaw it. But <laughs> let's go to, uh, you know, Liz, you wanted to talk about uh, Doug Burgum because we are Burgum stands here. Uh, and uh, his answer to a question about how to actually shrink government. Let's roll that one. Big government keeps getting bigger. One fifth of all new jobs this year have been created by the government. Governor Burgum, you say you want to shrink the size of government, but it has been a century since any president has done that. Why would you be any different? Well, because we've, do, we've, doing, we've done it in North Dakota. When I took office, we shrunk the state budget general fund by 27% in the first four months I was office, and we all the trains still running on time. Why? Because you had a business leader that was actually there. Inside of every government job, there's 10 or 20% of mind-numbing, soul-sucking work that even the state and federal employees don't want to do, and you can engineer that work out of the job. That would free up right there, 20% of 2 million civilian employees. And by the way, we've got 10 million jobs open. They'd have plenty to do, and they could be in generating taxes instead of being paid by taxes. This is totally possible to do it if you have somebody that understands because having worked in technology for 30 years, everything we had to do was to be better, faster, and cheaper the next day. That's what we can do right. in government. That's what we're doing in North Dakota. All right. 
Yeah, so I I hate to be like that technocratic bitch, but what he is talking about is totally reasonable, and it's kind of uh, disturbing to me that this type of soundbite isn't heard way more often. I'm sorry, but there is just an obscene amount of government waste. The fact that we are just pouring, you know, in all kinds of states, all over the country, and at the federal level, we are pouring so much money into various projects. I was just on a podcast earlier this morning talking about California's doomed rail infrastructure projects and comparing that to Brightline in Florida, which to be fair, also I believe was completed a little bit behind schedule, but it is stunning the amount of waste we have at all levels of government. And I think it is absolutely important to just kind of keep going back to that. I'm sorry, but if you were asking to fund more government programs or to fund them to a higher degree, the fundamental question that I want asked as a taxpayer is, well, how much money have we already poured into it? And have we seen the results that we expected? And if not, why? Who is to blame? Where is the drag? Where is the inefficiency here? I think it is such a bummer. I mean, look, Doug Burgum looks like a scarecrow. He looks like if Matthew McConaughey had some sort of like weird accident. Um, like he is obviously not a super charismatic guy. He's not extremely charming. I know he's not actually going to get elected, but my God, what a bummer that somebody like Doug Burgum, who is actually on the stage talking sense, attempting to just elbow his way in there to get a little bit of airtime, for whatever reason, people just don't really give a shit. Uh, and that's a huge bummer to me. Uh, I think it says really sorry. Uh, it shows that uh, we're in a very sorry state politically. The fact that he sort of decides to just consistently abstain from the culture warring and focus a little bit more on the importance of, I mean, he's the only one bringing up uh, energy policy. I know Chris Christie actually had decent answers about like AI and tech stuff, but Doug Burgum is just consistently actually returning the conversation to questions of government efficiency and to thinking about how we should sort of get out of the way of the private sector. To me, that's what an executive ought to be doing. I will pile on with some of the Burgum appreciation because this may be the last time we see or hear from him. But uh, <laughs> one thing that I appreciate about uh, his approach is that he is the kind of old school, fe like actual federalist type Republican where he'll pull the constitute the pocket constitution out and say, yeah. you know, even though I'm against abortion, uh, this is not something that's authorized in here. Or I think he did it again when we're talking about the trans issues. So I think the Republican Party would do well to get back to that sort that sort of uh, federalism going forward. Uh, Josh, any uh, Burgum comments? Well, while, while they're still available. I wasn't that impressed by by this. I mean, I just found it a little vague. I, you know, I'm sure mm -hmm. that yeah. there are lots of places where there's waste that you can cut out. But, mm -hmm. you know, that it, it involves doing specific things. And often the reason that, you know, that these things haven't been fixed before is that it's harder. It's harder to that it sounds to, to figure out, oh, yeah. like, you know, this is this is the thing you need to get rid of. I mean, you, you use the, the bright line example. And I think that there are some specific lessons to take there about rail. I mean, first of all, it helps that Florida is basically flat. Mm -hmm. um, they did a diesel system and they're not having to install catenary wire all over the place where they're building new rail line. It basically goes through the middle of nowhere, or runs down the median of a highway in Orlando. It's not going all the way downtown. It's going to a stop basically in a swamp outside the airport. And there's downsides to that. You can't really walk to anything from the station, but it does save money on land acquisition and engineering. And so there, you know, there, there's, there are specific lessons that you can take out of Brightline, which I think is an impressive project. But the problem is that sort of tells you certain things about how to build rail in certain places. And then you have to do that hundreds and hundreds of times over with other different areas of, of government. And sometimes sure. it's going to work and sometimes it's not going to work. Well, sure. So, I mean, maybe the bright line versus California rail example is a, a subpar one, but you could look at the struggles that the IRS has had with um, digitizing uh, their services. And you could look at, I mean, obviously there's the most recent infusion of cash. So it's, it's not reasonable to expect the IRS to have perfectly, you know, reformed the way they do things over the course of the last year, year and a half. But I mean, the IRS has been basically wasting money and really struggling um, to, actually carry that out for the better part of like what a decade and so i think you could point to like a federal agency that the executive would have much more control over in terms of appointing who is in charge of it and you could say like has the irs used their money well over the last 15 years because we just gave them a whole crap ton more money and so i would at least have a little bit of trepidation if if i were president with attempting to figure out how we are going to appropriately audit their use of funds 
And just to return to the bright line example for a second, Josh, isn't mm -hmm. the fundamental difference that bright line is managed by a for-profit company. So they have more of an incentive to make sure that they actually turn a profit down the line. And, and that, that kind of relates to what Burgum was saying. He's saying, you know, as a tech executive, I have some understanding of the role that kind of, you know, entre entrepreneurship and, uh, you know, private markets play and balancing those properly with the state as opposed to somewhere like California where you're building a rail and, you know, compromising with all these stakeholders so that the rail diverts through this mm -hmm. one county commissioner's uh, district that that it's just a completely different mindset. And perhaps that is missing from our federal government at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, the Bright, Brightline obviously is private and for profit. There are, you know, government assistance aspects to this with bonding and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. But no, I, th I think it's been a very good model and they're taking it out west to build a rail line from Las Vegas to sort of the Inland Empire. Um, I think there are, you know, there are limited numbers of places where that's going to work. I mean, look, the, the, the California rail thing is a complete boondoggle and it's good money after bad and they should shut it down, even though it's going to make people sad over there. Um, but I don't, you know... I, I don't I don't know that there would have been a viable way to build a bright line type project running from San Francisco to Los Angeles just because of the the ways in which the engineering would have been very complicated. And again, you you could have made choices like that. You're you know, the I, I think you're referencing how the line instead of running down the median of I-5 through the middle of nowhere through Central California, it runs through all the mid-sized cities in the Central Valley. And that yeah. adds tremendous expense. It doesn't add that much ridership. It's doesn't sort it of, also curve up through the desert because yes. of an LA County supervisor's political influence there? Like yes. yeah. Yeah, a, a, a Republican supervisor, I would note. Yeah. Um, but uh, the yeah, so it's you know it's the it's a set of political compromises that that led to to that outcome. But I you know the I the just the mere all the all the mountains you have to tunnel through there. I don't think you would have been able to get a purely private project to pencil in the way that it does with with Brightline. Not not it's 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 a good model, but it's it's, it's not going to work for everything. I I think it's worth maybe not getting too caught up on the Brightline example. One thing yeah. I think about with Doug Burgum is that. I mean, he, I believe, built a little bit of a fortune for himself based off of selling, uh, creating an accounting software company. And then he's been in the software venture capital space uh, since then, in addition to obviously being governor of, of North Dakota. Um, and I think the interesting thing to me is just like, well, this is really useful, interesting executive experience. I could definitely see him bringing um, almost the venture capitalist mindset to the table in terms of thinking about like, how do we invest in a whole bunch of uh, interesting or, you know, moonshot projects, not expecting that all of them will come to fruition, but attempting to sort of, you know, leverage, uh, you know, where we're spending money. And I would like to see just broad strokes, more of that type of mindset, that type of skill set in government. I think the fact that we are just so, uh, constantly fixated on career politicians on like the fucking Gavin Newsom's of the world versus <laughs> the Doug Burgums is just such a, it's, it's, no surprise to me why we continue to be in such a sad political place when that's what we collectively prioritize and value. No, I look, I I, I agree with that. My, my sole objection, maybe I was too fixated on this, is that I, you know, I I'm just skeptical of the idea that that then leads to a ten or twenty percent cut in in the workforce. I I just Fair I just enough, found that yeah. to be a simplistic. It's impossible, yeah. at yeah. least especially initially. Well, One thing that would right. actually be good if they want to be tethered to reality. Not that I voters really give a shit about this, but it's like. It's not like you do all these things on day one and mm -hmm. it's not like you make all these massive cuts just all at once. What happens typically is you do things over the course of many years. And so, I mean, the day one is such a classic political debate stage trope, but I'm really sick of it just because it strikes me as completely impossible. I guess the idea is to signal to voters, I prioritize this highly, but fundamentally you can't prioritize seven different massive policy areas highly. You need to kind of figure out what you're about. And frankly, trying to do a whole bunch of things uh, in a super speedy way or on day one probably leads to really, really poor implementation. Um, and I wish voters were a little bit more sensitive to that. Mm -hmm. On this topic of cutting government, uh, reducing the spending, the, my final clip was one I picked because A, there's a direct call out of Donald Trump, which harkens back to the beginning of our discussion. And B, there's discussion of the national debt, which I've come to view as an increasingly concerning topic. And it was at least brought up a few times here. 
Where's Joe Biden? He's completely missing in action from leadership. And you know who else is missing in action? Donald Trump is missing in action. He should be on this stage tonight. He owes it to you to defend his record where they added 7.8 trillion to the debt. That set the stage for the inflation that we have. We don't get any answers because Joe Biden hides in his basement and won't answer as to why he's raising the debt the way he's done. And Donald Trump he hides behind the walls of his golf clubs and won't show up here to answer questions like all the rest of us are up here to answer. He put seven trillion on the debt. He should be in this room to answer those questions. And I want to look at that camera right now and tell you, Donald, I know you're watching. You can't help yourself. I know you're watching, okay? And you're not here tonight, not because of polls and not because of your indictments. You're not here tonight because you're afraid of being on the stage and defending your record. You're ducking these things. And let me tell you what's going to happen. You keep doing that, no one up here is going to call you Donald Trump anymore. We're going to call you Donald Duck. All right. He's so proud. Uh, He's so yeah. satisfied. Just, yeah, let's yeah. just let's just look at that for a second. The self satisfaction. It's uh, you know that, off the that yeah. line is like so lame and groan inducing, and it has been in every debate clip roundup I have seen after the debate. It has achieved exactly what he intended for it to achieve, <laughs> yeah. and I think you know, I think he knew that it was like a total groaner, and he also knew that like it would be at the top of the hour in the montage on CNN every hour, and and it has been. I give Chris Christie credit for uh, pure entertainment value. Uh, he's yeah. ten out of ten on both of these debates. Um, the, you know that 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 also uh, brought this moment, which you uh, pointed, you were tweeting about this morning, Josh, uh, that uh, New York Times <laughs> uh, fact check was prompted uh. by Christie's statement that Joe Biden hides in his basement. <laughs> uh, this is false. Uh, any comments on? <laughs> Oh my God. The fact check. God, yeah. I just, I hate fact checking. I mean, like, cause, because the, the temptation that the fact checkers always succumb to is they go beyond like factual claims and they talk about, you know, well, like this was analysis and was it good analysis or did this lack important context and things that are ultimately judgment calls. And I think, you know, like it, in, in sort of fairness, the New York times, they're not so much correcting the literal statement. They're not being like, he's not in his basement. What they're saying is, well, like they're like, they're saying Joe Biden doesn't go out and do stuff, but he does go out and do stuff. And he traveled to all these countries. It's like, no, like when you say Joe Biden is hiding in his basement, you mean he's not out in public as much as he should be. And you mean that his, that the white house is trying to control his public appearances in a way to minimize spontaneity and minimize the number of questions he's going to face um, because they're, they're afraid of what'll, what'll happen if he goes off script. Um, and those are ultimately, those are not factual claims. Those are opinion, an opinion of how much the, how many interviews the president should give, how many events outside the white house he should do. There's no right or there's no fact about that. And so ultimately the, what this from the New York times is basically ultimately defending the idea that Biden is out there enough, um, which I think partly is a weird thing to do as a media outlet when, you know, one of the key aspects of, the, of Biden's strategy has been that he does very few interviews, many fewer interviews than presidents before him have typically done. But, you know, it, it's it's not even so much about whether the Times' analysis on, on that is right or wrong. It's that they shouldn't be doing that analysis at all. It's a question for voters whether they think that Joe Biden is out there as much as he should be. And that's, you know, obviously what Chris Christie was arguing about there. Yeah. I mean, the fact checking industry or complex seems to have taken a pretty big hit in credibility over the past several years. Do you think there's sort of a path back for that whole framework? Well, it's, it's not clear to me what the usefulness of it is to begin with. I mean, I, th I think it's, you know, people have been driven nuts over the last eight years by like people thinking things that are wrong. And, uh, you know, some some of that is, you know, like cancel culture and trying to, to restrict opinions. But some of it is literally about things that are wrong that like, you know, there's, you know, there's been a lot of prominent conspiracy theorizing and a lot of, you know, like nonsense claims about, you know, Donald Trump really won the election, and that sort of thing, things that are actually incorrect. And it, it drives a lot of especially liberals crazy. And it, just, it drives a lot of reporters crazy. And they're, they're not entirely wrong about it. But just sort of like grabbing people by the shoulders and being like, I'm going to give you the real facts now is, is not a strategy that's working in part because the sort of people who are bothering to read the New York Times live stream about the debate are not even the audience that they they really need to reach if they're trying to disabuse people of fa false factual notions. So I would if I had a fact check arm at my news outlet, I would I would just shut it down. If you know the most of what 
appears in fact checks is stuff that can just appear in a news story format. And sometimes even when you have a fact check that's really not about facts, it's, you know, it's an analysis about what the context for this ought to have been. You could repackage that as an article and often it would be an informative, interesting article. And you just lose the distracting frame where you're claiming to be, you know, setting straight some some fact. And to return to the su the policy substance of that earlier clip, yeah. you know, I appreciate that there was some mention of the climbing mm -hmm. debt uh, because I, I think it could become a, a very serious problem. And I am not, that being said, I'm not optimistic that anyone on that stage is pro-offering any solutions to get it under control. They're kind of just mentioning the number and then not mentioning any sort of path to reducing that either through increased revenue or, um, you know, cutting the programs that are responsible for, you know, or, or you know, our, our biggest uh, programs are entitlements. That's like off the table for anyone on that stage to mention at this point, it seems. DeSantis used to mention it when he was in Congress, and, but he's gotten hammered by Trump for those comments. And now n nobody brings it up. So, I'm glad it's a topic of conversation based on the policies not offered and also past performance of Republicans in office. I can't say I'm optimistic that any of them kind of have what it takes to like push forward a real agenda of bringing that under control. Nikki Haley has talked some about entitlements needing to be on the table. Um, I mean, it's very unpopular. Fair. That's why they don't like to do it. I mean, we also we, we've just gone through 30 years of persistently low interest rates and situations where the, there's usually slack in the labor market and the economy. And so the, the economic damage that comes from government deficits in certain economic situations has not really applied very much through that period. It has been more or less true that the government can borrow and spend money without causing inflation, without crowding out private sector activity. That's over. That ended with the the pandemic and the economic whipsaw of the pandemic, um, and it's just you know the I mean, the last the last time we had real deficit reduction politics was in the early '90s. There was a deficit reduction package in 1990. There was one in 1993. I mean, and then and then there was one in sort of 2011, 12 that I think wasn't wasn't actually good for the economy at that time because we were in that slack period. But the last time where you know it was really like mortgage rates are too high and politicians need to talk about how we can change fiscal policy to take pressure off interest rates so it's cheaper for people to buy a house. The last time we had that was 30 years ago. And just almost no one who was in politics then is still in politics. And voters aren't used to dealing with those trade-offs. I mean, I think, you know, I don't think we're going to have a really serious deficit reduction effort until we have some significant period of, of economic pain driven by those deficits, which, you know, we'll need We'll need some time with elevated interest rates um, and with, you know, the which, which are which will limit business investment um, because it's, you know, it's too expensive to expand your business because interest rates are high. You need that to be a reality for people before it becomes worthwhile for politicians and for voters to say, OK, what pain am I willing to bear in order to bring about this economy in which it will be easier to invest and grow. And I just, those conversations are never easy and they're especially hard when you haven't really had to have them for a few decades. Will people yeah. see that causation? I mean, if you if you go back and look at the 1992 presidential debates, they, they talk mm -hmm. explicitly about it. They talk about like, you know, the, the like mortgage rates are high because the deficit yeah. is big. I mean, I don't know. But do you think right now that no. will happen again? Okay. I, well, I, Right now, no, but I think well, that's a conversation no, we'll be I mean, over the next. I few mean, years. in the next two years, you know, say say our you know country's credit rating, um, yeah. you know, goes down, and say people sort of this begins to be an actual reality that Congress has to reckon with, you know, two years from now or four years from now when we're doing all of this crap all over again. Do you yeah. think that this will be something where we cut through the culture war, and this is what we? focus on or not so much? Maybe. I mean, you know, the, a lot of the Trump tax cuts are going to expire at the end of 2025 and that, you know, mm -hmm. the Congress will have to pass some new law or otherwise the tax cut will be a real mess after that. So that sort of creates a lever where you're mm -hmm. going to have to have some kind of fiscal deal there. And if control is split, then it'll have to be a bipartisan fiscal deal. Um, but I mean, the other problem here is that we, we've also gone through 30 years in, of bipartisan consensus that you should never raise taxes on anyone who makes less than like a quarter million dollars a year. Um, and so that makes it very difficult to draw up a balanced 
deficit reduction package. I mean, Democrats are very big on the idea that you you raise taxes on corporations and rich people, and you can raise a substantial amount of money from doing that, but so not a, not quite as substantial as a lot of Democrats seem to think, especially if they want to expand the government and not yeah. just just reduce the budget deficit. Um, and Republicans, you know, that have ever since 1990. 1990 was the last time you had a broad-based tax increase that got significant Republican votes. That was when George Bush Sr. broke his No New Taxes pledge. And that sort of was the birth of Grover Norquist's uh, pledge against raising taxes. And I think there's basically no way now to get substantial Republican votes for a revenue raising package. So you'd have to, they'd have to have a plan that's all spending cuts. But they, I mean, they weren't even saying that they want to repeal Obamacare, which used to be an applause line within the party. No. At, the, at this debate, let alone, you know, significant cuts in in defense spending or Medicare or Social Security. And then now we've just talked about most of the budget. So I think that, uh, you know, the, the we're very far from the realistic stage of talking about what a what a what a budget actually looks like that reduces the deficit. And I think it's also telling that when Democrats had full control and passed the, the so-called Inflation Reduction Act, which was supposed to be a deficit reduction bill. First of all, it's not even clear that it reduces the deficit at all because <laughs> the tax credits for green uh, investment look like they're going to be more expensive than expected. But even but if a lot more expensive too, right. not just a little. Yeah. yeah. But you know, even if it came in where it was supposed to be, it was basically like they, they had a bunch of new revenue and they spent what five sixths of it on new spending mm -hmm. and only a sixth of it went to deficit reduction. Like that was just like the, the, if, if, to the extent Democrats are already limited in, their, in what kind of taxes they're willing to raise. And then if they do that, they want to take most of the money and spend it, not reduce the deficit. And that's, you know, the neither of these conversations is anywhere close to where you would need to be if you were trying to actually have real effects on economic conditions by shrinking the deficit. I feel pretty pessimistic about people's ability to see the connections here. Specifically, I don't know whether it's fair for me to extrapolate to the degree that I am, but thinking about the relationship between COVID stimulus checks and the inflation that we're currently dealing with, the fact that so many people don't seem to grok the connection, which is not to say that inflation is entirely attributable to that, but certainly we can all agree that that was you know, a substantial part of it. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that people don't quite grok that relationship does not make me feel super optimistic about their ability to understand that going forward. But you know, I am happy to stand corrected. <laughs> And politics, yeah, it, I do fear that uh, Josh is 100% uh, correct that it's only once it hits a sort of, I don't know, crisis point, or at least people are really feeling it, that there's going to be any change. I mean, you know, you mentioned that there was this decade or so that of where it seemed that deficits didn't matter at all because interest rates more than were low. More than I a mean, decade, more than two decades. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, dur and during that time, there were people who were still saying, like, we shouldn't let this get so out of control, because then if the interest rates ever go up, then we're not going to have, you know, the kind of like dry powder. And that th that was ignored. Uh, so, you know, any sort of like prevention or preemptive measures to deal with this stuff rarely seems to uh, come to fruition. And, you know, the GOP now is barreling towards a Trump renomination. And Trump certainly seems like he has zero interest in this. I mean, he loves debt, both government and personal. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it does not seem to be, you know, part of his his calculus whatsoever. So I, I don't see how it's going to be addressed. Yeah, no, Matt Iglesias had a, had, had a smart piece on this a couple of months ago about how people aren't really thinking in, enough about what a Trump economic policy would look like in a second term, that if he sort of reruns his first term playbook, where it's like cut taxes and give people whatever they want and, and you know, run bigger deficits. And, yeah. you know, I, lo I love debt like that. That worked OK in the economic conditions that prevailed then. It wasn't it wasn't inflationary. I mean, I'm talking about the pre-COVID period. Um, you know, the, the the economy did grow a little bit faster through that period. Unemployment was low. It basically worked fine. If you do that now, if you come in and say in, in these economic conditions, I'm going to do what is really another stimulus if you do another unfinanced tax cut. And then if you do what he did with the Federal Reserve and lean on them and say, stop raising rates, I want you to cut rates. Um, if he has success with that or if he puts people on the Federal Reserve Board who will, who will do what he says on that, you could have a really big spike in inflation because of that. Mm -hmm. You know, if he, it's, you know, if he just you know, decides that what he's going to do is effectively send out more checks and cut rates, then people, the, the you know, excessive demand is going to get even more excessive. And you could see even higher inflation than we saw in, in 2022. Um, I don't think people have really thought about that possibility and, you know, the bizarre political effects it would have. But I think that's I think that's one real economic risk of a, of a second Trump presidency.
Yeah, for sure. And, you know, between that kind of brings me to the final question here, which mm -hmm. is between these offerings from the GOP bench an indicted ex-president destroying them in the polls, uh, an incumbents experiencing obvious cognitive decline, and then, you know, Gavin Newsom kind of weirdly lurking in the shadows. <laughs> What is missing from the 2024 presidential race for you? Or maybe another way to put it is what, where would you like to see this go? You know, look, I'm, uh, I, start with you. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure I have a much more positive view on Joe Biden than the two of you do. I, you know, I sort of give this mm -hmm. presidency a BB plus, um, you know, the, I, so I, I'll be voting to, to reelect him. I, you know, I don't, the, He's 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 old. He's obviously old. When people say cognitive decline, I think sometimes they're implying that he has dementia or Alzheimer's, which I don't think is the case. Um, but, you know, mm. I would have I would rather have Joe Biden 10 years younger as president than Joe Biden right now. I don't deny that, that his age. I'm sorry, you, you don't you don't think he has uh, dementia? No, no, I don't. I think that, you know, I think he's aging in a, in a normal manner, but not in like a, you know, like a clinically diagnosable manner. Well, but, um, but and I, you yes, know, and, and a lot of the. Like isn't that's funny here's a little bit like what do you make of his sort of inability to remember like what he's talking about and whether or not he's repeated a story two minutes ago i mean i, I to some extent i think joe biden has been like that for a lot of his political career i mean he was never yeah. known as a, as a precise speaker um so i you know i don't the i i think you know the even even though he is out there publicly less than a lot of other presidents are he still talks on camera a lot and you can pick moments out of it that create certain appearances. But I think, you know, the, by, I, th I think it's clear that he is running a white house that is, you know, you may, you might not like what it's doing, but it's broadly effective in doing what is with what in doing what it is setting out to do uh, politically. So you're not sitting there waiting for Gavin Newsom to swoop in from the wings. No. That's just an excuse for you to talk about your uh, recent article about <laughs> Gavin Newsom. Like what, why is he not the savior uh, in the situation? Well, look, I mean, Gavin's obviously going to run in 2028. And, you know, I'm sure he wakes mm -hmm. up every morning hoping that jo Joe Biden has died so that he can go out there and, and run for president. And, you know, like ha more than half of getting elected president is good timing. He's far from the only person who's hoping that somebody in his way will keel over dead so that he can go and, and become president. They're all like this. But mm -hmm. uh, no, I mean, the, the, the Joe Biden will be the Democratic nominee for, for president in, in 2024. Um, the thing about Gavin is that he he does nothing to bring swing voters into the Democratic Party. He's basically like it's an engineered in a lab to make MSNBC viewers happy. And his big, you know, the, his big attention grabbing initiative is this proposal to create a constitutional amendment to further restrict gun rights, which is never right. going to happen. And if Democrats campaign on it, they will lose elections because this is an issue where salience really goes against them. And, you know, they, they need to try to, like, do less that makes people think that they're going to try to take away their guns. But what it does do is it helps Gavin Newsom build a big email list of grassroots Democratic donors who can raise money from and who he can blast emails out to if and when he eventually runs for president. And so it's, it's a really selfish thing. He's doing something that's harmful to the Democratic Party and helpful to him. And, and I don't care for it. And, you know, I, I wrote this, you know, the, the, this Gavin Newsom is gross and embarrassing piece. And, I, you know, I, I actually I think people don't f fixate enough on the personal behavior of politicians. I think that, you know, like the, if, you mean you, dating a 19 year old. Um, yeah, like he, like he dated a 19 year old when he was 39 and mayor. Yeah. And he, he had an affair with his campaign manager's wife. He was married to Kimberly Guilfoyle. I mean, it's like if, if that alone if you, is disqualifying, right? If you look at behavior like if there was someone in your life personally who was behaving like this, you would you would look negatively upon it. And I think it makes sense to apply those sorts of standards to, to political figures as well, to look at someone who looks like they conduct themselves in an honorable manner from day to day. And I just I don't get that vibe from him. And I said, like, he sort of has Bill Clinton vibes for me, except that Bill Clinton was is charming and Gavin doesn't have that. So I just I, I think he's I think he's totally wrong. I think. California is a solid blue state. Being from California adds nothing politically for the party. It's, you know, this is also a Kamala Harris problem. Um, so I, you know, I feel a lot better about some of the Midwestern governors in the party, Gretchen Whitmer, Josh Shapiro. I mean, Pennsylvania is not technically the Midwest, but, you know, the Rust Belt. Um, I think, that, you know, just ha who have a, a broader appeal and have more experience appealing to swing voters because they've had to get themselves elected in swing states. Um, and I think that's a better asset if you're seeking the presidency. So that's where I would, you know, like to see us go after Joe Biden. I think 
like everybody else, I think Kamala Harris mm-hmm. is kind of a joke. Um, but, you know, in 2024, it's going to be a question of, you know, four more years of Biden. And yes, he will be he'll be a really old president. Conrad Adenauer was uh, chancellor of West Germany until he was 87. So it's been done before. Liz, what are your what's the best you can hope for out of 2024 here? I would really like a Peter Meyer type person, but who's like more of a straight shooter. I was reflecting as Chris Christie was talking and I found myself oddly enchanted by him. Mostly, I think, because I want to be like winter is approaching and I really want to like hang out in a dive bar and throw back some like pickleback shots and crush some beers with like a Chris Christie type straight shooter, you know, eat a slice of pizza, that type of thing. I kind of like that demeanor. Um, I would like to marry that whole vibe with some pragmatism and actual experience. And I find Peter Meyer, who um, was, I guess, Michigan's third congressional district representative for um, a bit, uh, to just be so tantalizing. I think it's really wonderful. I think efficacy should actually be prioritized. And I think being honest with people, um, I really, really dislike the pompousness of people like Vivek Ramaswamy. And I think we even saw this a little bit with uh, Andrew Yang. Uh, so to some degree, I want I want pragmatism and I want honesty. And I feel like there's not really anybody who represents that on stage right now. A lot of Chris Christie's policies I don't actually like. I think Nikki Haley arguably has some of the qualities that I'm looking for, except that she is a war hawk to far too great a degree uh, than I'm comfortable with. And so I don't think that she is actually a good uh, representative of the types of things that I want to see done. I feel now more than ever uh, incredibly politically homeless and really frustrated by the fact that you know, I there are so many people who identify as ind- independent, but voters out there who feel almost like what you're talking about, Josh. I understand that, you know, at the very beginning, you opened this up by saying that you think political parties are important, but you were talking about how you used to be uh, sort of Republican leaning and now you're more Democrat leaning, but you're frustrated by components of both parties. And I think that's such a common sentiment. I know so many people in New York who are used to be pretty hardcore Democrats and now very much feel like the left has gotten co-opted by silliness. Uh, a lot of the PC stuff has really driven them away. And there's there's this like, it's a trope at this point, the left left me. Um, but I would really like to see a candidate that appeals to so many of these people who feel as though their parties, whether Republican or Democrat, kind of abandoned them. Um, and it's kind of stunning to me that we have so many candidates that feel not like full carbon copies of each other, but a little too close for comfort. And for whatever reason, we're not actually focused on people being honest and people being effective. For me, you know, the things I want out of a president at this point is it's pretty, the bar's been way lowered. I, there's no way I could limbo under it. It's mostly a list of don't do this thing. Like (laughs) don't end the world by blundering us into an unnecessary devastating war. Don't wreck the economy. Parts of that involve actually addressing the debt at some point. Don't wreck our civil society by flouting the constitutional limits imposed on you or using rhetoric that's designed to make Americans hate each other and stay the hell out of my life as much as possible and devolve power to the lowest degree that you are able to. I don't think anyone on that stage hits all four of those bullet points, but uh, there might be people who are improvements to some degree or another on both Trump and Biden across multiple of those dimensions. I hope, you know, to return this to the, the theme we touched on in the beginning of this conversation, that the field gets whittled and that there's a bit more seriousness about Uh, kind of coping with the situation that the GOP finds itself at this moment with Trump, you know, polling over 50 percent, but not going to hold my breath for it. (laughs) I want to thank um, Josh Barrow for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Liz. Yeah. And thanks for everyone who tuned in and listened. We will be back next Thursday, 1 p.m. We will see you there.